Tara, I can't breathe, babe. That's on you. Tara, I can't breathe. <laughs> it's on you. With this case, we are taken to a very popular destination in the United States of America. Florida. It's quite a tourist destination for having hundreds of miles of breathtaking beaches and, of course, the amazing lifestyle that visitors get to witness. When it comes to crime, Florida isn't as bad as it used to be. The violent crime rate has been declining in the past decade, which is a good sign. But come 2020, something absolutely horrifying surfaced in the city of Winter Park, Florida. A woman, a man, a suitcase. February 23rd, 2020 was the day the crime was committed and February 24th, 2020, the day that would change the life of Sarah Boone and Jorge Torres Jr. forever. While suitcases are often used to carry the remains of a dead body in murder cases, in this case, a suitcase actually became the alleged murder weapon itself. Was it a crime of passion? Was it a crime of revenge? Or was it simply a game that went horribly wrong? Welcome or welcome back to Twisted Minds. My name is James and today, We'll be deep diving into the case of Sarah Boone. Not much is known to the public about Sarah and Jorge's early lives, but here's what we do know about them. Jorge grew up in Philadelphia and was a divorced father of three with an unstable work history. He also had a history of encounters with the law. He and Sarah were in a kind of on and off again relationship since about 2016. Sarah had been jobless for about two years before the suitcase incident. She and her child from the previous marriage, Lucas, live off the alimony from her ex-husband. She has a brother on active duty in the Marines who is based elsewhere. She also mentioned another sibling who is in jail. The couple's relationship isn't exactly flowers and rainbows all the time. Nobody's relationship is, but then theirs was more of a bruises and beatings kind. Most of the time, which isn't indicative of a healthy relationship in any form. Where there is violence, there are always grave consequences. Something happened when their relationship was at the year and a half mark. According to police reports, in 2018, the couple were at a bar together and Sarah asked a stranger for a cigarette. Jorge lost his cool and left the bar when he saw her talking to another man. Sarah followed and when they were both back in the apartment, they had a fight. Once the police arrived, Sarah claimed that Jorge had dragged her upstairs and kicked her in the eye. But Jorge had a completely different story. According to him, he ran upstairs to get away from Sarah because she had started to strangle him. What about her eye? He said he had to push her away from him and that he could have possibly landed on her eye. While they were blaming each other, neither wanted to write any statement and also refused any medical treatment. Both of them were arrested as it wasn't clear who the aggressor was. They were released when they got sober. Going by this, it doesn't really look like it was their first time they ran into problems and it certainly wasn't their last. There was another report from June 15th, 2019. According to Sarah, yet again, Jorge was jealous when she was talking to another man. He threw her off the bed and beat up on her legs, arms, face, and head. According to Sarah, he even threatened to kill her. He was arrested and released the next day with an order not to contact Sarah. Only three days later, on June 18th, Jorge went to Sarah's apartment and took her credit card without her knowledge or consent and left. Sarah called the cops. When the police tried to understand the situation, it seemed to be a little confusing. While Sarah says she didn't really invite him to her house, she didn't deny him access either. She didn't cooperate with the authorities because she didn't want Jorge to get arrested. He was found, arrested, and later re-released again. In September 2019, law enforcement arrested Jorge yet again for violating his bond terms. According to reports, he had kicked open Boone's bedroom door while she was asleep and had punched her in the head. But nothing seemed to stop the two of them from being with each other. The toxic lovers got back together and continued their relationship. They had a visibly unstable relationship. Even the neighbors complained that the couple would often play loud music in their apartment and that the police visited quite frequently. Their relationship was a ticking time bomb that was about to explode soon. Going by their previous police encounters and how neither of them was willing to give any statements, it's clear to see that they had a toxic relationship. Jorge was possessive and violent, and if Jorge's claims are to be believed, Sarah was aggressive too. This relationship was destined for doom. It was slowly cooking on a slow burner, 
and it was just a matter of time before one of them killed the other. It could have been predicted, but could it have been prevented? Who knows? But going by history, you'd expect Jorge to kill Sarah. Let's get to the really dark and sadistic crime and see what really happened. When the paramedics and the cops arrived at the scene, Jorge was purple, stiff, and dead. Just like Sarah had described the dispatchers on that 911 call. What led to this horrific crime? A man zipped inside a suitcase and left to die didn't really sound like an unintentional mishap, or was it? Here's what happened according to Sarah Boone. On February 23rd, 2020, Jorge Torres Jr. had come home with two bottles of wine to spend some time with his girlfriend of about three and a half years, Sarah Boone. They had a really good day together. They had some wine, started a puzzle at about 6 p.m. and finished it at about 7.30 p.m. Did a little bit of painting thereafter until about 8 p.m. and eventually decided to play hide and seek at around 8.30 or so. She went upstairs and hid in the shower, but Jorge didn't come to find her. She went back downstairs. It was time for Jorge to hide. They came up with the idea for laughs. Jorge and Sarah decided to put Jorge in a suitcase. She had zipped Jorge in, leaving a small gap in the suitcase for him to be able to breathe or be able to open the suitcase when he wanted to. She said they both laughed about it before doing it, and according to her, Jorge wanted to get into the suitcase and she obliged. They both wanted to do it for the laughs, although we don't really see what's hilarious about the whole thing. So going by Sarah's account, what happened next is even more unimaginable. Apparently she zipped the suitcase leaving a gap big enough for two fingers to fit. This, according to her, was enough for Jorge to be able to breathe and eventually get out whenever he wanted. After this, she went upstairs to her room at about 11.30 p.m., where she was awake for about 30 minutes before she dozed off, only to wake up the next morning at 11.30 a.m. What about Jorge? Since there was enough room left for him to be able to open the case, he must have hopped out and gone right about his business, right? That's what Sarah apparently had thought. She didn't come home for a whole hour after waking up. She thought Jorge was probably working on his laptop. When she didn't hear anything from Jorge, she came down the flight of stairs at 12.30 p.m. in the afternoon, only to see the suitcase right where she had last left it. To her horror, when she couldn't find Jorge anywhere else, she quickly realized that she had left him in the suitcase that night. She had hoped that he would be able to exit. She quickly unzipped the suitcase to find out that Jorge was purple, stiff, and obviously dead. Horrified, she called her ex-husband Brian Boone, who lives a mere block away from her, and then she called 911. Well, this is odd because if you're terrified and you see your boyfriend dead in a suitcase, you'll probably call 911 first. Was she trying to find a way to fix this or find a solution on how to get rid of this mess? Now, let's remind you that this was Sarah's account of what happened. These were the events that she described to the cops when they arrived and in the interrogation room later. Is this true? Is Sarah telling the truth? What will the police find? Sarah's story sounds ridiculous for a lot of reasons, which we will explore later. But for now, let's see what really happened. As we can clearly see, Sarah intended to do this to Jorge. This was no game. She wanted to punish Jorge for something, and she thought the best way to do this was to zip him up in a suitcase, leaving no room for breathing or to be able to open the suitcase from the inside. Jorge is struggling to get out of the suitcase. He's calling her name again and again, telling her he can't breathe. Sarah, I can't breathe, babe. Oh. You can also see him pressing on the roof of the suitcase repeatedly. It is evident from the video that she has zipped the suitcase entirely, so Jorge has no room to breathe, fresh air, and he can't even stick his finger out to try and unzip the suitcase. He's stuck inside. She's hurling derogatory remarks at Jorge and is punishing him for cheating on her and being violent with her in the past. That's what Sarah. I feel like when he's cheating on me. Sarah. I Fuck you. Breathe, Sarah. Yeah. Two videos were found on her mobile phone. They were 11 minutes apart. Sarah sounds intoxicated in the videos. Her speech is slurred and she is clearly under the influence of alcohol. However, that doesn't mean that she didn't intend to hurt Jorge. If she filmed this whole thing while sounding like she wanted to punish Jorge for cheating on her, then she probably went upstairs to sleep intentionally. 
She wanted Jorge to suffer for whatever he did to her. Going by Sarah's mobile phone videos, it's evident that this is a homicide. She killed Jorge in a sadistic way by leaving him in a zipped up suitcase so that he suffers a slow, painful, and suffocating death. This was no game of hide and seek. This was a game of punishment and death. But why? And what exactly happened after this event? Let's find out. The suspicion that this wasn't an accident but a murder started before the dispatchers even arrived at the scene. The clues start as early as the 911 call. On the call, Sarah doesn't sound as distressed as someone should be if they found their partner dead up in a suitcase. Her tone throughout the call is defensive rather than being more helpless or concerned or shocked. I fell asleep and I woke up and he was dead in the suitcase, so I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. It sounds like she's trying to do everything in her capacity to not look like she has anything intentional to do with it. The worst thing? The dispatcher tells her to perform CPR, and she's reluctant. I need you to get, I need you to get him on the floor, found his back for I me, did. okay? I did, I did, I tried giving him CPR. Yeah, okay, well, 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 nothing happened. He's purple. Well, okay, okay, lay him flat on his, okay, ma'am, like ma'am, 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 ma ma listen, all right, listen to me, I, uh, listen, listen to me, I want you to lay him flat on his back for me on I the did. floor. I did, I did. Removing the pillows, okay. Yes, I did. All right, okay. Wait. He's stiff and purple. If someone sees their partner under such circumstances, they will try to resuscitate them, and even if they're convinced of their device. She's not sounding horrified, nor is she sounding like she wants to help. She's only sounding like she wants to defend herself. One of the biggest giveaways in such murder cases is that the person who committed the crime doesn't just stop at what happened, but goes on to explain how they weren't at the scene, even when that detail is not required. They're more focused on convincing other people that they weren't there at the time the crime happened, rather than simply telling the details of the scene right in front of them. Another point of suspicion towards Sarah is seen in a body cam footage, when dispatchers arrive to an anxious and nervous Sarah, rather than a horrified and crying person who just lost their partner. Overall, she seems to be more anxious than sad. She was more concerned about having a cigarette and being all nervous about what was going to happen next than what had already happened. Sarah says that last evening while Jorge and her were playing hide and seek, Jorge got in the suitcase and she fell asleep. She woke up only to realize that she had left him in the suitcase last night. Notice her behavior here. I fell asleep. When did you do CPR? This morning, when I found him. Before you called? Yes! It's one o'clock right now. So, we're seeing a woman who found her husband dead in a suitcase, and she's not looking like she's sad or shocked or hurt, but She's looking frustrated, not an emotion that matches a person who just lost their partner to a slow and painful death. Here you can see the police officer talking to Brian Boone, Sarah's ex-husband. He says that Jorge was out on parole during this time. He had been arrested for domestic violence against Sarah. Brian also implies that he's seen the push and pull in this relationship where Sarah would get Jorge arrested but would bail him out the very next day too. Every time she had him arrested, the next day she was trying to get bailed out too. So I don't know what it is. It's like Sarah couldn't make up her mind about Jorge. She wanted him to be punished, but as soon as the law got involved, she felt the urge to bail him out. It's a very much hallmark sign of a toxic relationship. The ones where abuse is involved. The two people keep breaking up, but getting back together again because they're some kind of codependent. Sarah is repeating the incident to the police officer, and she says multiple times that she forgot that Jorge was in the suitcase. I fell asleep. Okay. Forgetting that he was so in the suitcase. you guys were playing the hide and go seek. Yes. And at some point you put him in the suitcase? No, he got in the suitcase. Now, imagine being in Sarah's place for a moment. You laugh with your partner and find it funny to get him in a suitcase. You zip him up completely. The next thing you do is walk upstairs and fall asleep. How is any of this making sense? How can you forget something of this sort? But Sarah has the answer to it. She blames it on the alcohol. She's already starting to create a base for her subsequent interrogations. Note here that Sarah implies that she and Jorge aren't really alcoholics or anything. It's just a little bit of wine once in a while. So you guys don't normally drink? You just drink once in a while or? Well, I'm gonna say like, 
Barely a few hours ago, Sarah found Jorge dead in a suitcase. And she's not bothered about that as much as she is about Jorge's family's reaction when they find out that he is dead. She's automatically assuming that they'll blame her because apparently they hate her. She's so worried for her own safety at this point that in this very scene of the footage, it seems like she's the victim who called the cops for some kind of protection against a criminal. We're gonna I'm be just here telling you, like, yeah, I'm, this is gonna be I'm a while. afraid for my life. I want you to know that. I am afraid for my life. His family have never liked me. I'm the blue eyed white devil, is what they call me. Her behavior is incoherent with what's actually happened. And she continues to remain worried about her safety and what the authorities are going to tell Jorge's family. She is so unaffected by the incident and Jorge's death that the only thing that she seems to be affected by is the aftermath of the whole thing on her. Those are the only things she's thinking about. There's no Jorge in her mind. Do you think Sarah's behavior matches that of a person who just saw their partner's dead body? They're gonna think they killed him. Why would they think they always have said that. They've always, always, always have said that. Have I told you it's because I'm the blue-eyed white dragon. That's what they call me. She wanted to show that Jorge's family might try and blame her for what happened. Sarah was in a constantly defensive mode, which is more consistent with a guilty criminal's behavior than an innocent person who just lost someone they loved. Just to remind you, this is the day when Jorge was found dead in a suitcase. This footage is merely hours after Sarah dialed 911. And if you thought this is all, we are yet to see the main interrogation that happened two days later on February 25th, 2020. The third suspicion regarding Sarah's innocence was the whole hide and seek game. Think about Sarah's story. A 42 year old woman puts her lover in a suitcase for a game of hide and seek. She then goes upstairs and sleeps for 11 hours straight, assuming that the man in the suitcase will magically hop out on his own whenever he wants to. Upon waking up, she walks downstairs and is shocked to see her boyfriend is still in the suitcase and is now dead. The whole story fabricated by Sarah makes no sense whatsoever. Only two days after Jorge's death, Sarah was called in for questioning on Tuesday. Let's see how that went. Right after victim blaming and also playing the victim card at the same time, Sarah is swift to show that she cares so much about Jorge, how she's helped him through everything so that he can become a better person. I've really helped him. I've bailed him out of jail, what, three times. I've gone to every single hearing and every single arraignment, everything that I did for him. I've gone to see all his public defenders, go to the state, I've gone to the state. I, I did everything for him because I'm trying to help him because I have. A Open. So according to her statements, if he was even a slightly better person, it was all because of her. Not to forget, her tears don't seem legitimate, as it's so clear in the footage how she's oscillating between being so matter of fact to crying, and then barely seconds after that, she's back to being so unfazed. She's switching between the two expressions almost instantly, and she's back to victim blaming. And she's very descriptive in his utterly destructive behavior toward her, and not so much about her behavior toward him. So he always had something on his mind, which is why, again, I got the puzzle and the bank to try to get him off of it so we don't have a drink, or he doesn't have a drink. Nobody knew George better than I did. I say that I knew George better than himself. Here you can see how Sarah likes to be in control and feels like she knows Jorge better than he knows himself. Then she immediately starts off with how much she helped him again. She even says, ask anyone. And I tried in every way, shape, and form. Ask everyone. I helped him. I took care of him. When the interrogator shows Sarah the footage from the video she shot on her phone, she takes a long time to respond. She's probably shocked to see that footage as she has no recollection of filming it. She probably has no idea what's coming up. To appear calm, she quickly points out the low battery in the laptop. For everything you've done to me. Your battery's about to die. Sure, you know. 
She wants time to think and she's found it. She quickly adds that she wasn't planning on going up and sleeping. She's trying to show that whatever there is in the video that you're about to see, she didn't intend to do it. And I wasn't planning on going upstairs and going to sleep. Okay. From now on, throughout the interrogation, she will play the unintentional card. So, why is she scared? It's probably because she knows what's about to happen. She doesn't want to watch it. She says, is it long? To show that she doesn't know about the video, but she instantly gives away that she does know about it by saying, I don't know how much I can take. Is it long? Because I don't know how much I can take. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much I can take. In this whole part, Sarah doesn't really have a comeback because the evidence is right in front of her, filmed by her. George has done that in the past before too, where it's just like he thinks that he's woe is me kind of thing, where it's like, I don't well, He's think. never been locked in a suitcase, but no. he couldn't get out, so. It's kind of, I thought it was the, boy the oxygen crawling wolf, crying wolf kind of thing. Okay. And again, my plan. But, that, but nowhere in there is he laughing, is he joking, he is begging. And you're the only one laughing. Okay. And you're the only one saying derogatory comments. Like you're mad. No. Please don't. I don't mean to sound negative, and I don't know if I can say this, but <coughs> like it's like you guys are kind of trying to like feed me. Like. No, I'm just trying to show you a video that you no longer want to watch because you probably don't want to know the outcome of how and what you said. She's not ready to take any accountability whatsoever despite the glaring proof right before her eyes. She's one of those people who will continue with their denial mode and project it onto others, if only others were buying it. So here we have a deceased Jorge in this case. We have footage from her own cell phone, which is incriminating evidence enough that she's responsible for his death. She's still trying to prove that she didn't try to do any of it intentionally. Here, it's easy to see how Sarah is so cornered. Initially, she said she doesn't like to be drunk. I don't get, I can't get drunk. I, number one, I do not want to get drunk. And here, when the interrogating officer points out that it is indeed obvious that only someone who is intoxicated won't remember filming those videos, she gets defensive. You know, you know what's on that video now? No. You remember making that video? No. Why don't you remember making the video? Probably because we had been drinking. But you weren't drunk. No. Just because I went upstairs and just you because you're us, drunk doesn't you mean that you times that you were not drunk. In my experience, if somebody cannot remember doing something to the extent of making two videos and a video and taking a photo, they are intoxicated. Okay, I understand where you all are coming from. She is trying to imply that they're putting words in her mouth. Well, they're simply catching a liar in a lie, if you ask me. You can see how she is talking calmly and suddenly loses her composure when she says it's awful. Like it's all backfired on me and I understand the severity of this. I just... You it's awful, I know. Okay. It's awful. And I will tell you both this right now too. I will never drink alcohol again. Okay. Like I will never drink alcohol again. I don't care what it is in any way, shape or form. She also says she will never have alcohol again. At this time, the interrogators are almost waiting for a confession, but are they going to get that? So what was your intention for leaving them in there? And it's not fair. It is not fair. You guys are trying to, again, oh, he's in there. Night, night. That's what happened. No. That's absolutely what happened. Intentionally. How's it not? You got up off the couch walked up a flight of stairs and got in your bed. Thinking he was going to get out. And he didn't. And you still didn't go down and And it's up. the whole 30 minute thing that you guys are trying to do. I don't care about Whatever. It's like, I, for all He's I know, it's 10 minutes. He's begging for his life. He's begging for his life, telling you he can't breathe. Her entire body language, when the interrogator says 11 minutes, is like it's no big deal. Look at the size of this suitcase and think, is 11 minutes a long time for a fully grown adult? Even a child will have a tough time there even for a few minutes. 11 minutes is long enough to suffocate you and cause a lack of oxygen, pain in muscles and bones, and because you can't move them, and later on death, likely due to suffocation. He's begging for his wife, telling you he can't breathe. I don't know what you want me to tell you. Like, I don't. I didn't intentionally mean for this to happen. Now she knows she can't cover her tracks by denying what she did because there's proof. 
So she's trying to convince them that she didn't intend to do it. She's trying to steer clear of the first degree murder here. She knows that she will inevitably go to prison because of the damning evidence against her in her own voice from her own phone. But if she shows that it wasn't intentional or it was an accident, something that wasn't premeditated, she will be safe against first degree murder charges, which are usually the highest and in most cases, come without the possibility of parole, depending on the magnitude of the crime. So you guys think that I intentionally... You did. It, you it, got it doesn't matter what you It doesn't matter what you think. I walked up the stairs and got into bed. That was intentional. There's no way getting around that. You intentionally did that. Nobody drug you up there. You didn't float up the damn stairs. Okay, well it's not fair. It's not fair that you guys keep trying to say that that's what I did. Okay, you left him in a bag when he's begging you, saying, I can't breathe, let me out, and you said, fuck you. And you got up off the couch and went upstairs and left him in that bag. Not intentionally. Again. I would never do that to George. You did. Not it intentionally. Happened. She gets aggressive yet again. Sarah couldn't really be calm for long. Notice her nodding her head almost violently as she says, know that. To the interrogator. Know that! I don't. Know that! You got up and you went up to bed. Alcohol is a shitty thing. It's alcohol. She's forcing them to believe her and when it doesn't work, we're back to alcohol blaming. She stands up in the middle of the conversation. She's that hyper at this point because nothing seems to be working and the interrogators are not convinced, not even in the slightest. She then again tries to tell them how everyone knows how much she cares for Jorge and all that she did for him. Everyone knows, everyone knows everything that I've done for George and love him and continuously help him throughout his life. I can't explain to you, I can't explain to you how horrific it was okay. to find him. Horrific, because I don't remember taking those videos. Okay. How horrific. Sarah's emotions are not following her words. Like we've been saying, she's all matter of fact. It's so strange to see someone whose partner died merely a day or two before have literally zero emotions. We don't see any pain, sadness, or even horror. I mean, you'd be horrified to find your partner dead in a suitcase, right? Hi. I don't agree with alcohol. And it's unfortunate that stupid things like this happen. <coughs> this is the moment of truth for Sarah. She's handcuffed and she's about to go to prison. What's odd? She's still emotionless. There's no expression of shock, fear, or sadness. Nothing. Absolutely nothing except that she's still repeating that it wasn't intentional. Why is this happening? Because George is dead. Not intentionally. We understand that. She's still dead. No emotions, but her mind seems to be working overtime. She's been asking the two interrogators what she should do next the whole time. The only person she seems to have been concerned about the whole time is her own self. Why would Sarah kill Jorge? What did she want from him? Going by the history of their relationship, it seems like she was fed up with his possessive and aggressive behavior. She was punishing him and taking revenge. But nobody has a right to torture and kill anyone. The legal system exists for a reason. She could have reached out to the authorities and filed for a restraining order, but she didn't. Every time Jorge or their relationship ran into the law, she'd bail him out and she'd get back with him. Maybe because she was guilty of turning him in every time. Their relationship was toxic, so maybe it was a kind of habit or pattern which made Sarah used to the abuse. Or was it because she had nobody to control once he went to jail? She was angry, frustrated, and upset at what Jorge did to her over the years and she wanted her revenge. According to Jorge's autopsy report, he died due to positional asphyxiation and the manner of death was homicide. Jorge was in the suitcase for 11 long hours. What is positional asphyxia? Here's the definition from Wikipedia. Positional asphyxia, 
also known as postural asphyxia, is a form of asphyxia, which occurs when someone's position prevents the person from breathing adequately. People may die from positional asphyxia accidentally when the mouth and nose are blocked, or where the chest may be unable to fully expand. A fully grown adult male aged 42 was in that suitcase. No matter how big that suitcase is, it will always be small for an adult human being. He suffocated because of the position he was in. He couldn't breathe properly and couldn't expand his chest as he was in a kind of fetal position to fit the bag. He must have also used up all the oxygen in the bag and after a while, he had no access to the outside. There was no way for Jorge to get enough oxygen to be able to breathe and keep himself alive. Not only that, he also had bruises and cuts on his head and hands and also a black eye. So, had Sarah and Jorge been in a fight before she put him in a suitcase? Sarah claims that Sunday was a really good day and there were no fights whatsoever. Nobody laid hands on each other. Can we believe Sarah? Well, if she is telling the truth, then maybe these bruises and cuts are a result of moving the suitcase too much after putting Jorge inside. Maybe she tossed it and turned it around multiple times. Or even worse, she pushed that suitcase down a flight of stairs in her home. In fact, a neighbor heard a loud noise and it sounded like someone falling down the stairs. Do you recall hearing anything coming from apartment three while you were, um, after you had gotten home? Uh, around 10.30 or 11 o'clock, there was a very loud crashing sound, I believe is the location of the, uh, the staircase. You said crashing sound? Yeah, like it sounded like something had been like, falling down the stairs. That's a bone chilling detail because if it is true, Sarah probably took the Jorge filled suitcase upstairs and pushed it down the stairs. And that explains the bruises and cuts on Jorge's body. While this isn't proved, it's the most plausible explanation. Throughout the interrogation, Sarah claims to have never done this kind of thing before. Putting someone in a suitcase, that is. Police find out that's a lie. Around five years ago, Sarah had been investigated for putting a picture of a child in a suitcase on her Facebook page. When the police investigated, they found that it was consensual and the kid wanted to get a picture of himself inside the suitcase. Was it really just a coincidence or did it plant a seed in Sarah's mind? A seed for the plan that she went ahead and executed on February 23rd, 2020 by zipping up Jorge in a suitcase and leaving him to suffocate and die. Sarah was arrested on February 25th, 2020 and is being held without bail at the Orange County Jail in Florida for second degree murder charges. Her trial was initially supposed to begin on March 8th, 2021, but it got delayed and is now set to begin on November 7th, 2022. The pre-trial conference is set on October 25th, 2022. At the time of filming this video, the pre-trial conference has yet to take place. Now, we already know that this is a homicide, whether premeditated or unintentional, is going to be for the jury to decide. And we'll see what happens. But one thing is for sure, either way, Sarah is going to be convicted. Will it be a first degree murder or a second degree murder or manslaughter? This could also be taken as a depraved heart murder. For those of you who don't know what that is, here's the definition from Wikipedia. In United States law, depraved heart murder, also known as depraved indifference murder, is a type of murder where an individual acts with a depraved indifference to human life, where such acts result in death, despite that individual not explicitly intending to kill. In a depraved heart murder, defendants commit an act even though they know their act runs an unusually high risk of causing death or serious bodily harm to a person. If the risk of death or bodily harm is great enough, ignoring it demonstrates depraved indifference to human life, and the resulting death is considered to have been committed with malice aforethought. In some states, depraved heart killings constitute second degree murder, while in others, the act would be charged with wanton murder, varying degrees of manslaughter, or third degree murder. If no death results, such an act would generally constitute reckless endangerment, sometimes known as culpable negligence and possibly other crimes, such as assault. This definition pretty much fits the Sarah and Jorge case, but what does the jury think? 
For that, we will have to wait for the trial and see how it goes. Knowing Sarah Boone's hyper personality by now, we know that she wouldn't really sit very quietly. Well, here's a letter she wrote to the Honorable Judge Wayne C. Wooten. Now, this letter is somewhat of a complaint about the lawyer, Mauricio Padilla, who was supposed to represent and defend her, but got off the case. The letter is nothing but a whole ocean of words and sentences that scream, Sarah. She is being her apparently confused self, who knows nothing about the process ahead, and is pleading and requesting help so that she can bring forward her truth. Well, it looks like here too, she's making it look like she's the victim in the case. She says she is desperate to move forward and she is emphasizing her best interest in security above all else. Let that sink in for a moment. Does she realize she's the suspect and has been charged with second degree murder? Or is she still confused if she's the victim and needs all that security and safety? Against what? As of now, she has no choice but to await her trial, which has been delayed. It's been two and a half years since she packed Jorge in a suitcase and left him to die a painful and lonely death. We don't really know what the verdict will be, but from all the evidence and interrogation, it does look like a depraved heart murder or second degree murder. Is there a way in which Sarah can defend herself in this case? Again, according to the Hornsby Law Firm, the killing of a human being is excusable and therefore lawful under any one of the following three circumstances. When the killing is committed by accident and misfortune, in doing any lawful act by lawful means, with usual ordinary caution and without any unlawful intent, or when the killing occurs by accident and misfortune in the heat of passion, upon any sudden and sufficient provocation, when the killing is committed by accident and misfortune resulting from a sudden combat, if a dangerous weapon is not used and the killing is not done in a cruel or unusual manner. Going by this, Sarah can defend herself by calling it an accident and a misfortune, but she will have real trouble in making it look like not cruel or unusual because Jorge died in a suitcase, which is very cruel and unusual. This wasn't any kind of self-defense from Sarah too, so that's ruled out. And it's common knowledge to any adult that staying in a completely enclosed suitcase may eventually lead to death by either suffocation or asphyxiation. She is no child to have not understood the consequences of her actions, which means that she was fully aware that death could be a result of what she was doing. She has slim to no chance to walk away completely innocent from this case. Moreover, as we know, Jorge's death was not normal. It was a torturous ordeal that he had to go through before he succumbed to his fate. It was a lonely and painfully slow death, which took away any dignity from him in his final moments that a human being should have the right to. This was beyond cruel. If she wasn't happy with him and had complaints against him, she could have reached out to law enforcement, but she took it upon herself to commit this heinous crime of revenge. This is a tragedy that would eventually consume both Sarah and Jorge in different ways. It was a time bomb that would inevitably explode to finally tear the two apart. Thanks for tuning in to Twisted Minds. That was the case of Sarah Boone. And why don't you go ahead and click on one of the two videos on your screen for another one of our videos.